Uh, hi, everyone. I hope you are not uh, too hungry. <laughs> so, doctrine migration. Just a bit, uh, a little word about me. I'm uh, Mike Simonson on Twitter. I'm a web developer at a small consulting company named Cube Solution in Belgium. Thanks to this talk, I also became the doctrine maintainer, the doctrine uh, migration maintainer. And when I'm not uh, somewhere behind my computer, you can probably find me hiking or running somewhere. So now that you know a little bit more about me, I'd like to know a little bit about you. Who here uh, use doctrines? OK. <laughs> Everyone, pretty much. Uh, doctrine migration? OK. Um, you expect me to teach you something, or? <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you use doctrine migration with? Do you use like MySQL? Who, who use MySQL? OK. Postgres, anyone? Lucky ones? Uh, <laughs> There will be a lot of uh, gotcha with MySQL in this talk. Um, OK, cool. So you all know what doctrine migration is, but very quickly, it's just a tool that allows you to version schema change, uh, and it's based on the database abstraction layer of doctrine. It just means that you are in the context of having to rebuild an application. You have old data, and you need to put that data back into the new application. If you are in the context of just developing an application, you don't have any data yet, and you just want to update your schema, you don't really have uh, to use doctrine migration. That's a lot of pain for not a lot of gain. Um, if you don't have any data, you can just use any of the other doctrine commands that are provided natively, and you can just update the schema. It will work much faster and much easier. So the goal is just to go from old data to clean data. Why doctrine migration and not any of the other contender? Uh, why did I choose that one for my project? The main reason is that in all of those tools, most of them, either way, they are super strictly tied to a certain framework, or they are tied to um, a certain database abstraction layer, or a certain DSL that try to mimic uh, my, uh, SQL in some way. But most of them, they try to be compatible with all or the most databases as possible, so they don't use any of the nice feature of the database that you, will, uh, that you will use. So it wasn't really a good fit for me. I preferred to uh, have the control of doctrine migration, where you can use the nice tool if you want, but you also have the power to do whatever your database can, can deal with. Uh, the other side of that coin is that it gives you a lot of control, but it also gives you no guarantee about the result. Um, if you try to use doctrine migration in production, especially, it's not going to give you any guarantee as to, oh, do I need to put my application down for like two hours because it's adding a column to someone in a non-optimal uh, way, and it's taking a very long time to well, uh, that table is locked and nothing can work in my application. That's entirely, that responsibility rests onto you when you use doctrine migration. If you don't want that responsibility, there are other tools like Liquibase, which is a um, Java tool. Um, the way it works is that basically you describe in a migration file uh, what you want to change in the schema. And then Liquibase figures out how to, how to do it in the most optimal way. It's a tool that's built by a database administrator that, are, that have way more experience than me. So if what you need is performance, that's probably what you should look at. Um, 
in other case, if you want, for instance, if you are more in the content of a data warehouse or you need to do a lot of analytics on top of your data, then you are probably also better off uh, looking at an ATL. Do, do you know what an ATL is? It just stands for uh, extract, transform, and load. It's just a set of tools, a family of tools that are that specialized into extracting data, transforming that data into something, and just loading it in another data store. Uh, if you do a lot of analytics, that's probably what you should look at. They are designed for that. Back to doctrine migration. Like pretty much everything else nowadays, you can install it using Composer. And uh, if you are not using Composer, there is also a FAR that's available. The configuration is uh, straightforward. Sorry, can you hear me? So the, oh. <laughs> the configuration is very straightforward. If you have already used Doctrine, this is just like the configuration of the Doctrine connection. And the rest is uh, a very simple configuration where you have to mostly give the directory where you are going to put your, your files and the table name where it's going to store which one have already been run or not. Once that's set up, it gives you a set of tool. Um, some of them are very obvious, like latest or up to date, just tell you what is the latest migration or if you are already up to date, if someone else in your team uh, has created new migration that you pulled, did you already run them or not? But besides that, the first one that you are probably going to use is to generate one. Um, generate will create for you a file in the folder that you have configured that has by default this format. The version part is just uh, the way we find out uh, which file we need to load and the rest of the file name is used as a way to order the migration. Uh, so it's an alphabetical order. You can put whatever you want. By default, it's the current date time. But as long as, uh, as you know what you want, you can, you, can, you can put string to make it more explicit what, uh, what, uh, what is in the migration, which is like mostly what I do, uh, because the date time is hard to type, and it's not very explanatory. Um, yeah, that's most of it about the file name. The content is, it's just a class that extend, extend abstract migration. It requires you to uh, implement an up and a down function. Simply like, I guess, all of you know, up is to migrate up, down to migrate down, to reverse the migration. It also provides you with uh, pre up and a pre and a post up method and also a pre down and a post down method um, that have the exact same uh, signature. Uh, to be totally honest, I've never used them because I don't really know when they make sense, but they are there. The power, the main power that uh, Doctrine Migration provides you is that it's going to run those methods. If you, if you migrate your uh, migration, it's going to do the pre-up, the up, and the post-up method all in one transaction. If anything goes wrong at any moment in one of those methods and it throws an exception, it just rolls back. Uh, and you are not in an in-between state where you you have to fiddle by hand in the database to get back to a, a working state. Again, um, there is something that works very, very well in Postgres, but if you are using MySQL, the problem of MySQL is that it doesn't support a DDL statement in transaction. So a DDL statement is all the statements that change the schema in a way or another. 
if you use one of those statements somewhere in the migration, it's MySQL is just going to auto commit the transaction and continue. And if something fails after, well, too bad. You are in a in a state where you need to fix it by hand. Uh, the most obvious way to make to fix that, if you use MySQL, is just to put all the DDL statement in a different migration. I have always like one migration for the DDL and another one that actually loads the data uh, afterwards. That way, I avoid most of the case where the data load fails and then my schema is wrong. As you see in the signature of the method, you are passed a schema object, a doctrine schema object that is just an object that describes yeah, the schema of your database. It's very convenient if you have to support multiple databases, for instance, and you don't want to tie yourself to MySQL or Postgres specifically. You can just use uh, that uh, OO interface to add or drop a table or change it. If somehow you need to be a little bit more specific, um, you can use the add SQL method, and there you can enter any SQL that you want. It's just passed directly uh, to the underlying database. Um, it's passed directly, but if you are loading data, for instance, you can also uh, use that as a prepared statement. It can, uh, the, the two optional parameter here, oh yeah, the signature is wrong because it's equal null. I mean, they are both uh, optional, those parameter, uh, and it will make a, a prepared statement out of it and run it. Please don't mix those two. Because of the way it was designed back, uh, back when it was designed, if you are using the schema object and the add SQL method in the same migration, you have absolutely no guarantee on the order in which the SQL statement are going to be run. Um, if you will, when you, when you use the add SQL method, it just build a big array of all the SQL statement that you are adding in your migration then it fetch all the SQL that comes out of the schema object and run them after. So if you're doing add SQL, then doing something with the schema, schema and add SQL after, you won't have the change that you did in the schema available to the add SQL. Uh, SQL. There is too much SQL in that sentence. I hope it was clear. Just don't use both at the same time. It's not gonna do what you expect. As I said, avoid DDL statement in the same, uh, in the same migration uh, as the one where you are loading the data. Another gotcha, again for MySQL, uh, there is a very old bug that is not going to be fixed in uh, PDO MySQL that allow you to send multiple SQL query in the same prepared statement. Um, in itself, it doesn't look like a big deal, um, but it is because if you have that case here in one call, in one prepared statement, I'm creating three tables. If it fails at the second one, it's gonna report that everything went well, and you, you, you have absolutely no way to know which one failed. It just report like everything, everything was okay. So yeah. Don't use PDO MySQL, maybe. Another command, uh, execute. Execute is just designed to test the one migration that you just created. You maybe don't want to, uh, to run all your migration, but you want to make sure that the one that you just uh, wrote works in the way that you expect. You can just execute it up or down. Uh, you can even use uh, the dry run option that is not shown here, um, and that will just output the SQL that is generated by your, mi by your migration without running it, just to have an idea of what is going on. The status command, like its name gives away, um, is mostly there to 
tell you if you are if you if you are using doctrine migration through a framework, uh, there is probably an integration for it, and it might be hard to know which configuration is uh, loaded exactly. So it gives you those information and other information about where you are uh, in all your migrations. The diff command. Um, that one is very handy if you're using Doctrine to map your entities to your database. It's just going to use that mapping information to figure out what change it needs to add to have a database that is reflect your entity. Um, it works very well in Postgres. It works a little bit well in MySQL, but it can be a good... Uh, a good tool just to have an idea of what change are currently present in your schema. The migrate command. Um, the way the migrate command works is that you just give it the orange part here of the migration name, and it's going to figure out how to get there. Uh, either way, you have already run a few migration after it, and it's going to run all those migration down to reach that migration, or it's going to run other migration up to reach that point. It also doesn't really care um, about the exact order. What I mean by that is that if it needs to run down some migration and then run up another one so that all of the previous one are run, it's going to do it. it. It just makes sure that if you pass it that migration name, everything that's below has been run. That's the, the way it's designed, at least. Yeah. Back to the actual migration. Uh, in my case, uh, the project was fairly typical for a legacy application, maybe. Uh, the guy who had uh, built the whole application just left without any documentation, uh, without any test. It was a big ball of mud, basically. A lot of PHP 3 pasta style code. Uh, you can already see the function.include.inc.php file that are copy-pasted everywhere. The tables in the database had hundreds of fields. Specifically, one of them seemed to hold pretty much all the data of the application. It was called address, but it holded like person, clubs, you name it. Everything was in there. There were also fields that had like no data at all in the gigabyte of data that it contained. It was really weird. And obviously, it was using MyISAM, so despite uh, using foreign keys, uh, most of the foreign keys were just not working. I mean, they were referencing data that did not exist in the, uh, in the reference table. Based on that, we decided to rebuild that app, and rebuilding that app meant new database schema, obviously, and yeah. That's, that's when you realize that you will need to find a way to get back all the data from the old schema and put it in the new one. So we did that in step. We first tried to normalize a bit the schema to at least understand what was in there. Then we realized that the char set of the strings that were in most of the table wasn't correct, so they were they were showing weird character, not Polish character, but like really weird question marks and stuff, just wrong char set. Actually remove all the data that is just not valid. Uh, you can, for instance, like they had a lot of data that are where zero, zero, zero. Like, please never use that. It's totally useless. If you want to break your UI, it's the best way. And then import all that data. I don't know if any of you has uh, any experience of schema normalization. Do you know like the, the normal form of uh, uh, a schema? So 
the idea is that there is a uh, just theory on that, a few, uh, six, I think, normal form uh, that describe how you can design a schema, a database schema. And um, the more you go uh, in the schema normalization, the less you have uh, repetitive data in your table or data in two different places that can be hard to synchronize. The goal is just to, to have the schema that is uh, the easiest to maintain for the database itself, to make a schema that is easy for a SQL database to deal with. And here I'm, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the third normal form. Uh, it's the most commonly used one because it, it just has a few common sense. Uh, advice on how you should design your table. So one of the stuff, the first rule is that you should only have one value per field in any table if you want to respect the third normal form. What that means is that in this table, for instance, you can see that we stored uh, a reference to the game that has been won by a particular user in, a, in, a, in, in the application. Obviously, the more game you have, the harder it's going to be to know which user is, uh, has won it. Um, it's, it's basically a format that the, a SQL database cannot deal with. Unless you are trying to implement a NoSQL database in MySQL, which is a bad idea, you should not uh, do it like that. What a SQL database expects you to do is to have multiple uh, records, and each of one holds uh, a reference to one game that has been won. It doesn't mean that uh, there aren't legitimate use to have like comma separated values sometimes in a field. Uh, it just means that I couldn't come up with an example that made sense uh, in the presentation, but maybe there are. No multicolon attributes. Um, that's also a uh, very common one in the uh, legacy application that I see. You have fields that have like dash one, dash two, dash three, dash whatever. Obviously, it's not really scalable. You will always end up having someone that will ask for just one more. And it's really hard to deal with the data afterward because you never know where it is exactly in which fields it is. Um, again, if you want to normalize your schema, it expects you to have uh, one contact info here in this case per row. It doesn't mean again that there aren't very good reason to have reference to uh, the same entity in uh, in different place, but in that case, it just means the the case where it makes sense are the case where the relation has a different meaning. Like if you have a relation that is like address, billing address, for instance, and uh, mail address, those, those have really two different meaning, and it can make sense to have two reference to two different address in your table. But if it's just dash one, dash two, dash three, and there is no added value to it, you are just like shooting yourself in the foot. Only store information directly linked to the table primary key. Uh, here you can see that we are having a table that stored the results of some test for a certain, certain student. It doesn't make any sense in that table once you have the ID of the teacher to also repeat the teacher name. That data is already in the teacher uh, table and you're just duplicating it for the sake of duplicating it. Duplicating it, sorry. Again, it doesn't mean that there aren't valid use cases to use it. Like the most common one is probably the invoicing one. But here, I mean, but in the case of the invoicing, uh, you want to make sure that no one is able to modify that data because legally they cannot do it. As long as you have made an invoice, the name, the date, especially in the case of the invoice, the address cannot change. And then it makes sense to add that address in the invoice. But in any other case, it doesn't really make a sense. 
that one is a, a mistake that we did. Um, you will often, when you redesign your application, end up in a situation where uh, you will see a tag somewhere that is attached to an entity, and then another entity that also has a tag. But both are called tag, so it looks like it could make sense to put both of them in the same table. And you decide to add a type field, and one is going to be for one entity and the other for the uh, second one. And then when you keep building the, the application and you know more about it, you realize that, in fact, one of them wasn't exactly a tag, and whatever is stored there cannot show up in the other, and you start really entering into problem. The trying to over-optimize by putting too much data and separating it just because it has the same form or it looks like it's the same, that, that's really a mistake that we did and that, that cost you a lot of time. If you can avoid it, I would like, if you don't know what it's going to be, just make it into separate table. It's never going to hurt to have too many tables. The char set issues. Um, I'm going to be relatively quick on that one because it's very specific to the database that you use and um, there is basically an endless, uh, endless cases that you can encounter. If you don't know exactly how the data has been put in the database, it can be really, really hard to uh, get it out in a, in a way that makes sense. But basically, the idea is that there is a char, set, a char set for the table where you put the data. There is a char set for the app or the web page that send you, the, the browser actually, that send you the data. But there is also a char set for the connection between your application and your database. And that's the one that most people forget about. Uh, despite it being very important, especially when it's set by default on a, uh, on a Windows machine, you can get into really weird situations. So basically, the main cases are uh, you can have just a consistent char set in the old system, and you just want to change it in the new one. That, that one is fairly easy. You can have an inconsistent char set in the old application, either way because the connection or the tables have uh, a different uh, char set between them. Those ones are a little bit trickier. Um, hopefully for us, MySQL has a functionality for the first case that make it really easy. Uh, in that case, you just need to convert the char set. That's all you have to do uh, to the new uh, Trust set. It takes a very long time, but it works. So there is that. In the second case, it's a little more tricky because you need to make forget MySQL that it was uh, a char set in the beginning. So you have to do a little dance to. First, use the old char set at the connection level to the database. Then you make the field a blob so that MySQL forget about the fact that it's, in fact, uh, a string with a certain char set. And then you can change the connection char set and set it up back to what it was originally. Um, that should work. Uh, it turns out that sometimes it didn't work and that we didn't know exactly why. Um, yeah, that one I really have no explanation. But if you want to have better information of that, like basically the, the, the place where I could find all the information that helped me for that was um, the blog of Percona. I don't know if you know Percona. Um, it's basically a company that specializes uh, in MySQL uh, support and, uh, and consulting uh, that is created basically by the creator of MySQL. They have a really, really good blog where it's basically 
the sanest explanation that you can find on MySQL anywhere. I really, if you use MySQL, you should really know about it. They have the most up-to-date and the most clear explanations. In the case of the inconsistent char set where the client and the connection uh, have a consistent char set, then again, it's fairly, fairly easy because you just, you can just insert into the new table after having select and it's magically going to work. Okay, the main point about all that work is that it's way too big to try to do in one migration. So you just have to iterate a lot. And if you iterate a lot, you are soon going to realize that the main thing that uh, holds you back is, is the speed of the migration. If your migration are slow, it's going to be a pain to test. It's going to be a, a pain to continue working on it as, as more as you add them. So I ask you the question, if you want speed, uh, what do you do in a database? Sorry? Exactly. On what? <laughs> so like having indexes is obviously the answer. Now the trickier question is where to put them so that they are used. And the even trickier answer is like how to write the query so that it's going to use the indexes. Um, it changed a lot in the last version of MySQL. Now the last version 5.7 uh, can deal with using multiple index in the same query, but it's something that it couldn't do in the previous versions. So you really had to pay attention to how you wrote the query so that it could use them. So, out of those two ways to write a query, um, which one do you think is going to be the fastest? Okay, who thinks um, updating, sending updates one by one is going to be the fastest way to go? The one? Okay, who thinks um, the unduplicate key here construct is going to be the fastest one. Okay, so for those who don't know, the reason why this construct is faster than this one is basically because this one is only going to update the index once. So instead of having to write every index back for every query, here it's going to do it once after updating for record. Uh, you have to try out with your database and your setup to know how many you can safely uh, pass at once. But in my case, you can go by the thousands and it's really super fast. At, at least it's so much faster than trying to do it one by one. Uh, it's also a construct that has been very recently added to Postgres, so you can enjoy it too if you are using Postgres. In other cases, when you are not doing update but just inserting, I've seen a lot of people trying to make like really giant query that add everything at once in the table. And this, despite that it can be fast, at some point you also have to think at like, can I just understand that query or is it going to be to take me like 45 minutes to understand what it's trying to do? Uh, where, where it's failing. Uh, in some cases, it can be like so much faster to write simple queries, but simple queries that you can understand and you can change because you're gonna have to come back to that migration a number of times. The main reason for that was that in, in our case, in the project, the old application continued to evolve while we were building the new one, which is like not the best case that you can have, but yeah, we had to deal with that. So we had to continuously migrate the new data that was added to the application with the change that they added uh, while we were working on the new one. Okay, two other queries. Out of those two, 
uh, which one do you think is going to be the fastest? Who do you think that um, an insert where in is going to be faster than a left join? Well, it depends. <laughs> Basically, it just depends on the number of record that the select here is going to fetch. As soon as you have more than a handful of record, uh, more than like five, 10, the performance becomes horrible compared to just a left join. Uh, basically, the, the, the reason is really simple. With an with a in, it cannot use any index at all. With the left join, it can use them. So it's usually going to be much faster. As I told you, it's sometimes much easier to cut the job and write simple queries uh, instead of trying to write win one big query that uh, does everything at once. In our case, often, we had to pull data from multiple table and then update that table with foreign keys to those other table. It's obviously quite hard to do in one query. So what I used to do is basically to take the foreign keys, uh, make them nullable so that I could add the rest of the data in the table, then update the foreign keys, and lastly, make them non-nullable anymore. Um, it works very well. Uh, with one little catch on MySQL, there is uh, the MySQL mode if you know about them. And by default, an older version of MySQL, older than 5.7, by default it's using the basically crazy mode. There is no mode, and that means crazy mode. Uh, crazy mode means that if you do that, um, making a, a foreign key null, then uh, putting the data in and make it not null after, what I would have expected is basically MySQL to explode if something is empty somewhere. And instead, it's just take the null and make it zero, which is really useful because like zero doesn't you exist in the table. And it's basically like you didn't put any foreign key. It's nice because you discover it when you test the application uh, live. OK. Yeah, I suppose you know the set foreign key uh, check trick to just empty the table. Um, again, it's a, a way to get rid of the indexes while you, you are emptying the, the, the table in your down method when you need to go down. Um, yeah. Sadly, it wasn't really enough in our case to make the migration fast. Uh, when we did that, it was still taking like 45 minutes to run, which is not really convenient. Um, the first thing that we tried is uh, basically put, um, there is a, a MySQL engine that is the memory engine. It used way more memory than what's used on disk. It used roughly like eight times what's used on disk by the tables but it's much, much faster. And as long as you have machines that are big enough to hold that in memory, you should really try that. Uh, you basically go from 45 minutes to five because everything is in memory. After that wasn't enough because we just didn't have machine big enough to do that, we just tried to do the same uh, in AWS. And despite the cost of the machine being prohibitive, because you are just using it for a really short amount of time, it's still a big win. Uh, so if you can try that, I would really advise you to try it. What else? Um, in some case, some people want to use Doctrine Migration to also propagate other change that they are doing in their application. And to do that, you can use the container aware interface if your framework uses a container. Um, and then they access the ser their service and do something like, oh, let's rebuild all the cache of the images that have been uploaded in the application. Um, it's a use that, has, uh, that is valid. But 
I've seen people using that to try to fetch the entity manager out of their application and then use the entity manager to migrate the data. That is never, ever going to work in a proper way. Uh, the first reason why it's not going to work is that it's, it's going to be horribly slow to pull all the data out of MySQL or out of your database and put it back in. And the second reason why it's going to be horribly slow, and not even that it's going to be horribly slow, it's just not going to work. Imagine you have one entity user and you change it by adding a field or something. The entity manager is just not designed to know about two versions of one entity. So, yeah, just don't do that. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, my recommended way is that like, if your application needs to support multiple databases, then use the schema objects. In any other case, I would just stick to use uh, AdSQL and do whatever you want in there. Another reason to not use the schema that I didn't talk about is that um, the fact that we pass to you that schema object, it means basically that we have to build it. And if your schema contains hundreds of tables that have hundreds of row, uh, hundreds of columns, it's going to take a long time to build that object, and it needs to do it for each migration. Um, that problem has been fixed in the sense that now, if you are not using the schema object, it won't build it at all. But you have to know that it has a very real cost when you are using it if your database is big. Um, another way that I used to limit that problem is that basically the connection that I passed to Doctrine Migration, I filtered out of that connection all the tables that I knew I would never use. Basically all the tables from, uh, from the old, uh, old systems. Another reason to do that is that basically uh, the schema would just crash when it was trying to represent tables that didn't have any, any uh, primary keys, which was the, ca the case in the, in the legacy application. But the added benefit was that it was much faster. So yeah. Any other questions? No? OK. Uh, <laughs> Please uh, don't forget about Joindin, and if you have any, if you don't have the time to use Joindin, just like catch me uh, now. <laughs> have a good uh, end of conference. <laughs>